nuclear detonations. So that data is protected and poured over. Many experts say the world is closer to a nuclear catastrophe through a nuclear bomb use, closer ever since the Cold War has happened. The world is becoming a more dangerous place. But how does the world detect if there are cheaters or if there are people who are violating that there should be no nuclear explosions? I have with me the world's foremost expert who monitors nuclear explosions 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, Martin Kalinowski. He's the chief scientist at the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization in Vienna. Uh, Martin, tell me a little bit about this very vast network which you have put up. Yes, we have a global network of 321 sensors of four different technologies. So we measure seismic, acoustic waves, we measure infrasound in the atmosphere, and also acoustic waves in the oceans, hydroacoustic sensors, and we measure radioactivity in the atmosphere with radionuclide measurement stations. And, and, and is this a 24 by 7 network? Or how, is the, how does it work? And how do you have so many stations? Oh yes, it's a continuous operation and continuous data availability from around the globe. And how we operate it, of course, there are station operators in 80, more than 80 countries that operate these stations for us. And the data are transmitted through a global communication system to our uh, base in Vienna. We have our organization in uh, technical secretariat in Vienna and there is an international data center. We receive all these data, we share them with the member states and we process these data automatically. So as soon as the data come in, we start processing them. We get out the results immediately in different formats and bulletins, lists and bulletins and products and then our the state signatories can look at the data and the products that we generate from these data to get indications of what they are looking for. They are looking for possible se signals from nuclear tests. So all these, eight, the setup in 80 countries is essentially owned by the CTBTO or owned by the member states and they are uh, sharing with you? We pay for the stations unless there is a contribution in kind from a state signatory paying for the station and we pay for the operational costs of these stations. Typically, they are local station operators under contract from, our, from us. And, and, and which was the last nuclear test you really uh, recorded and what did the member states react to? Yeah, there were in, the, in this Millennium in this decade, uh, there were uh, tot in total six tests. So they were all announced by North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The last one was on 3rd September 2017. It was also the largest uh, with regard to the uh, energy release. Um, how did the state signatories respond? Well, we briefed them on the day of the test we invited the delegations in Vienna here for a briefing and we informed them about the signals that we detected, which were unusual, but they were obviously in the location of the DPRK test site and it was an announced test, so it was easy to draw a conclusion. If they had not announced, would you still have been able to figure out that uh, DPRK had done a nuclear test? We can detect any test globally, anywhere, at any time and the signals are reported immediately. Um, I need to, to explain that the, the mission of our organization is not to declare whether it was and not to make a judgment, whether it was a nuclear test or not, because this is up to the member states to do, but we provide them with the data and the products so that they are able to do it. We can screen with certain parameters that can easily distinguish, for example, an earthquake from an explosion. And this is how the state signatories with their national data centers can make this difference and then easily and fast, very fast, very quick, interpret the data and understand whether this was a nuclear test or not. 
Uh, many people say you can detect only tests which are done where there is a yield. Those tests which happen within laboratories, the ones which happen at the National Ignition Facility in America, the ones which happen in UK, those, those, those are also for upkeep of nuclear weapons and can you detect those? Well, first, there is a question of what exactly is a nuclear test. If you are co talking about laboratory experiments, that may not be a nuclear test. Um, but I'm talking of the subcritical. Yeah, what, what you need to understand is that at the time when the treaty was negotiated, 1993 to 1996, and at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, there were criteria f that the monitoring system needs to meet. and of course, you have to make some assumptions. Therefore, the assumption at that time was that the goal is to detect every nuclear explosion with a yield of one kiloton TNT, which is 1,000 tons of TNT equivalent energy release, with a certain high probability, very, very high probability. The sensor network was designed to have the sensitivity to reach this goal. In the meantime, we have 20 years uh, of scientific and technical innovation, and the sensors became much more sensitive. So now we can detect any explosion, not even nuclear, also chemical explosion, at a very much lower uh, uh, energy release. Um, so what is your threshold today? It depends on, uh, for example, the current regional seismicity. So. In, if there is an earthquake occurring right now, then of course the sensitivity is not as high. There's background noise and everything like this. We express this as a magnitude, like the Richter scale is known, and our goal is to detect something at the level of 3.5, magnitude of 3.5, but we can go even further down. It's difficult to give you an exact quantity, but depending on when and where, it can be 10 times more sensitive or even 100 times more sensitive than the detection goal was. So that, that is our capability. But if there is a nuclear test that has any kind of meaning physically to really test a nuclear weapons design, it will always be above a kiloton. And even if it is below a kiloton, like the first DPRK test was below one kiloton, we can still detect it. Well, India also did three sub-kiloton tests yeah. in the Shakti series at Pokhran. Yeah. They declared yes. they were sub-kiloton tests. Yes. And many say that wrecked the yes. whole monitoring system of the CTBT. Well, at the time, 1998, in May 1998, when yes. India and then Pakistan declared tests and conducted tests, the international monitoring system was not yet established. But there were already a lot of stations in place in the locations where we now have our system. And we receive those data from these stations, like in initial testing data. And we already received software early. So at that time, the organization was just starting up. I remember this thing. So we didn't do the analysis at that time in, in real time, but a, a week or two later. So it was just a little delay, but we were able to uh, uh, detect these tests, these announced tests, yes. Now, this vast network yeah. which you have set up, yeah. uh, other than the seismic part, yeah. is this the world's largest sensor network which has been placed globally? Other than seismic, that's a good start because uh, there are other seismic networks that are in fact larger. Um, so it's, it's not the largest seismic network, but maybe the, the seismic network with the highest data availability, it's authenticated data, so it has special quality features that are unique. But if you look at the other three technology components, we are absolutely unique on a global scale. Uh, let's start with infrasound. Infrasound is a technology that was used in the Cold War times for detecting of, uh, nuclear tests, but it, was, it didn't have any civil applications, any scientific applications. So this kind of network and all, also the sensors are, it, were at 
20 years ago, completely unique for our international monitoring system. In the meantime, there are many more national systems coming up, but they are not connected in a network. So we have the only global network of infrasound stations. Then when it comes to hydroacoustic, um, first I want to mention that hydroacoustic waves propagate very well, well through the oceans, and therefore just 11 stations of hydroacoustic sensors are sufficient to cover all oceans globally. And this network is the only global network of hydroacoustic sensors that we operate. We operate the only existing global network. And for radon nuclide, it's also the same. It's not only uh, high purity, high volume, very sensitive detectors that are not normally used frequently for radiation protection purposes by radiation protection authorities, um, but it's the only such network of systems that is global. So there are a lot of national, even regional networks, but this is the only one that exists globally. Uh, when you look at the map, yeah. there are some white holes or black holes mm -hmm. of data, and one of them exists in South Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to plug that hole? <laughs> okay, um, the network is now more than 90% complete, almost 95%. All of the stations are up and running, certified. Some delay in, in certain regions uh, is caused by various for various reasons, but in, in the region that you just uh, referred to, uh, the treaty even has not named stations. They, it has just placeholders with no uh, place name and no country. But if you look at the alphabetic order, they are all numbered in alphabetic sequence. It's exactly at the location where India would fit in. So in that regard, you can assume that if India would sign the treaty, that India can offer to also host stations that would fill these placeholders. But does that gap in data affect the quality of data you have from across the globe and would cheaters get away? The network has redundancy and the signals propagate globally. Therefore, even if a country that covers half a continent would switch off all their stations, not just one, but all the stations they operate, the monitoring system is still effective because seismic waves propagate throughout the globe and they, they can be detected on the opposite side of the globe. So it's not a technology that requires and depends on vicinity of a sensor to a source of energy release. It's a bit different, of course, for infrasound because that doesn't uh, uh, travel across the whole globe, but we can detect, we, we have experience in detecting infrasound signals at 10,000 kilometers distance and longer. So uh, if there is a little gap in the network, it is not a big issue. It may reduce the sensitivity in that region a little, but it can still cover the region. And the same with radionuclide sensors. I already said that the hydroacoustic sensors are anyway easily global. So, so can you keep your hand on your heart and say, to all the member states who have signed and ratified that if ever tomorrow a nuclear test is done, a nuclear atom bomb or a hydrogen bomb explosion, you and your network will detect it for sure. Yes, the, the, the network is mature enough and uh, built up uh, to, a, to a degree of completeness that is definitely sufficient to reach the mission that we have, detecting nuclear tests globally, uh, meeting the minimum requirement of detecting it with 95% probability at a one kiloton TNT equivalent energy release, but much, much better in most cases, in most places. So nobody can get away? Nobody can get away. So, yeah. so the world is safer because of your network? Definitely the world is safer, but we want to make it even safer by putting this treaty into force. Because currently the network is existing and built up and operating in a testing operational mode. And it's ready for being put into an operational mode by the treaty entering into force. Once 
all signatures and ratification are in place, the treaty foresees a period of half a year and then the system should be in operations. And we are preparing for that. We are almost ready. There are only f f uh, small things to be tested and uh, completed. But in principle, the system is ready. And we, we just need to wait for eight more countries to sign or re uh, uh, three of them to sign and in total of eight to ratify. I am not going to get into the politics with you. You are a scientist yes. on the reasons why America and China, India and Pakistan, Israel and Egypt, and the complications of why there is no uh, enforcement of the CTBT. Let's leave that aside. Yeah. Let's 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 sure. keep that for the politicians to handle. I know where to ask those questions. This network, which has been set up largely to test, uh, figure out if there is a nuclear test. Has it given spin-off benefits which were unforeseen? Yes. Um, in principle, these data, since they monitor the whole globe in different ways, um, are a vast asset for humanity and can be used for civil and scientific applications. If I mention civil application, I'm talking about disaster risk reduction applications. And the first one that we put into operations uh, was triggered by the very unfortunate huge tsunami in Sumatra on 26, I think, December 2004. 2004. Yes, and immediately after this, the state signatories realized that they should use, make, make the IMS network data available for tsunami warning purposes. Now we have 15, no, 16 tsunami warning agreements already in place with 16 different regional or national tsunami warning centers. There can be more. Um, and uh, today we heard a presentation at our science and technology conference uh, where uh, the director of the International Tsunami Information Center said that since the last decade and by having the CTPTO data and further method enhancements in place, the early warning time was reduced from 45 minutes to 15 minutes. There's another application that came into place and was agreed by the PREPCOM, the Preparatory Commission for the CTBTO, after Fukushima. Immediately after Fukushima, our organization made available radionuclide observation, observational data to the WMO and the IAEA, and we joined the international, international uh, consortium of international organizations that exchange data for the purpose of early warning, early response on nuclear and radiological emergencies. Fortunately, none has happened since Fukushima, but we are ready. We joined this effort and we are ready to provide our data for this kind of purpose. There are many other... Tell me other examples yeah. which are very different. Yes. I'm sure people would want to hear set up for test finding nuclear bombs, yes. but helping save lives. I think that, that would be one interesting thought which my audience would love to hear about. Exactly. So You mentioned about tsunamis, you mentioned about yes. Fukushima. What are the other areas where it has, it has given spin-offs? Yeah, so um, I mentioned the two areas that are already used because the preparatory commission decided this is an application that we can give the data out for. Of course, always under signing confidentiality agreements, the data will not be used for other purposes. The scientists worldwide have studied various other applications that could be made with our data if a decision and agreement uh, would be uh, made, reached. Um, one of the most prominent examples is volcano ash warning for civil aircraft because if an, a jet airplane travels through a, uh, an ash plume of a volcano it can make the jet engines not uh, disable them and the jet can uh, fall to ground and crash and uh, incidents like this have happened and have uh, luckily not caused any uh, uh, casualties um, but uh, the risk is there and of course, there are other systems like satellite observation and there are uh, local observations at uh, volcanoes. But for some remote volcanoes, 
uh, the information is rare or not available or if cloud coverage hinders the satellite imagery to track a plume of a volcano, um, then the world is kind of blind against volcano ash plumes. Our infrasound network uh, monitors volcanoes and, and, and captures the sound of the eruption that can bring with it uh, ash emissions. And uh, the Volcano Ash Advisory Center of Toulouse has already made a access, data access agreement with us for scientific purposes to study the feasibility of this approach and found it's, it works with historic data. So some uh, communities are now trying to push to make this also, uh, to bring this to a decision uh, by the Preparatory Commission. See, one of the big challenges the globe is facing is climate change. Mm. And with a vast network across oceans, mm. across continents, over land, over, over air, uh, are you helping uh, uh, understand climate change a little bit? Yeah, there are all kinds of sensor data that can be used of our network for climate change studies. For example, hydroacoustic data, if you have a, a constant source somewhere distant, then uh, the travel times of this frequency and frequency changes to so all these um, specific signatures for a distant source are dependent on the ocean temperature at different depths of the ocean. So you can see this as a thermometer for ocean temperatures at a depth where you can't bring a thermometer down. And another example is um, with infrasound, you can study phenomena of the stratosphere where you can't have a lot of uh, uh, radio sounds or other measurement equipment brought up, but the um, reflection of infrasound at the tropos tropopause uh, and other uh, phenomena of infrasound give information about things like the temperature fields and wind fields in the uh, higher troposphere or the uh, lower stratosphere um, these, and these data can be observed over longer time frames. And uh, by doing so, uh, patterns can be uh, recognized how things change f over the years. We also have uh, other examples like... Um, you, you had mentioned something about yeah. icebergs. Yeah, yeah I w just wanted to come to this because one of the effects of the global warming is that more and more ice shelf is breaking and falling into the sea and then drifting as icebergs. So the carving of icebergs is a sound effect that we can measure with seismic and hydroacoustic data. Even the tracking of icebergs while they migrate through the oceans is something that we can follow because an iceberg is a constant source of sound. It's always creating new cracks while it melts and then some parts of the ice is falling down into the ocean as huge rock, ice rock pieces. And this creates a sound that we can locate. And we can, uh, the experts could use our data to even track the path of an iceberg until it melts completely. So, 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 so your network could help, say, avert a titanic kind of a, a, a collision? Yeah, it's similar with the uh, volcano ash plume warning. Of course, there are systems for warning existent already. Uh, icebergs are tracked. Um, but uh, th these tracking depend also on satellite imagery. And if there's cloud coverage, it's harder for the satellite data to sense an iceberg. So in these intermediate periods, our hydroacoustic data could take over or supplement existing monitoring data with other systems. So to make it more safe and robust uh, to have iceberg warnings for, for ship. Uh, India has categorically said on, on the signature for the CTBTO, not now, not mm. later. Yeah. Uh, yet, uh, I believe there is something interesting you've done with the monsoon. So what is the connection between atom bombs and the Indian monsoon? The connection comes from the radionuclide detections that we do every day in 80 places globally. And there's one specific radioisotope, it's beryllium-7, which is of natural origin, but we observe it every day in every station, in every location. It is created in the stratosphere, and only by global circulation patterns it's brought down to Earth. And 
since the uh, with the seasons the global circulation cells are moving northwards and southwards there is a seasonal variation at each of our locations and the monsoon onset is driven by the move of these circulation cells the global circulation cells so with the beryllium 7 ground based measurements we can monitor the movement of these cells that trigger the, the monsoon to start. So we can see the cause that creates a monsoon before the monsoon even starts to come. And this allows, if the data can be used in according to preliminary studies, it seems to allow a prediction of onset time of a monsoon one or two months in advance. We studied this for the Kerala monsoon. We studied this also for other monsoon areas in the world. And um, we cannot only predict the onset time, also the withdrawal time, because also monsoon withdrawal depends on global circulation patterns. So, so sh this finding on the monsoon, which is kind of a serendipitous finding from your network, yeah. should that nudge India to sign the CTBT and or, or do something to get closer to the scientific aspects of the CTBT and the network? Of course, signing the treaty is for the primary purpose of uh, monitor uh, for, for um, uh, the signature is to uh, bind the country not to uh, test a nuclear explosion or not to test, uh, to, to, yeah, not to do a nuclear explosion. And then our monitoring system has this primary purpose. But for every state that is, is uh, signing this treaty, there are side benefits coming. That, uh, the side benefits that we just discussed uh, can be used from the data that are available from our network. So India could also benefit from all these side benefits that we were discussing. And in my view, it is good if these possible benefits, side benefits, help to, tr to enhance discussions within India to promote their signature of this treaty. And have there been any discussions on those lines? At least in the scientific community? We are in contact with many scientists of India. We have uh, this science and technology conference. Indians are represented, Indian seismologists and uh, other experts. So we have, uh, since, since all the time of uh, the existence of this uh, treaty, uh, Indian scientists have been engaged in, in discussions on the scientific uh, level. So in a way, uh, the vast network you have, which set out to look to detect nuclear explosions, is, is probably going to get taken over by the large and many civilian applications? I would not say taken over. But, uh, no, but if you invest such amount of money for a global system that is unique and special, um, then you should look into allowing these data to be used also for other applications so that more benefit can be drawn out of these data. The interesting thing is that the more people, scientists, experts, are using the data, trying to understand them, the more we learn about these signatures and what is noise for us because we want to filter out only the signal of a nuclear explosion and everything else is noise to us is the valuable signal for others. So if they learn to better characterize, understand, monitor these other signals, it will give benefit return to us, CTBTO, and we can enhance our methods for treaty monitoring. So we see this as a mutual support. We can reach out and make, allow others to use our data for other purposes, of course, with certain limitations, confidentiality, prep needs to agree, and so on. But we know that this will return benefit and will enhance further the capabilities of our primary mission, the detection of nuclear explosions. Do you want to add, other than these four technologies, anything new which will help enhance uh, the capability of your system? The, the possibility to add more is, in, in, is written into the treaty. So uh, if um, state signatories, after entry into force, decide that there is a new technology that they would like to add, then there are ways and means to do this. 
so money worth invested into this vast network where the money is definitely worth invested and um, we make the technology always uh, more efficient cost effective uh, so we can get better and better with uh, doing more with uh, at least not more resources um, so the money we invest is giving more and more benefit that was dr martin who's let's say the chief scientist at the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty organization with a vast network of sensors across the globe initially set out to detect nuclear explosions cheaters and if there were new countries which were doing it or the old countries doing it but then this data is being used by a whole set of new breed of scientists to understand global geochemical phenomena and dr martin says this is money worth invested by the world it is making the world a safer place and helping save lives at the city video in vienna austria palav bagla What a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Pleasure speaking to you. Very good questions. Well organized. <laughs> nuclear detonations. So that data is protected and poured over.